Well, hello everyone. First of all, thank you very much for coming along, giving up your time. Um, I'm going to talk about trying to simplify this down as much as possible, just give you some of the components of climate change. Okay, so first of all, we're just going to look at some of the historic change, some of the historic data, remind ourselves that climate change has actually occurred already. Um, then I'm going to briefly describe some of the future projections, and then really what that means to the coast, um, what we can expect to do and what we should be doing. So the thing to understand about climate change is that it's quite complicated. It will impact on a lot of different processes on the coast. So it's going to change um, mean sea level, it's going to change extreme water levels, it'll change the, the air temperature, it'll change the currents. Now, we've only got half an hour today, so what I really want to focus on is mean sea level. So that's mainly what I'm going to discuss. I'll talk a little bit about waves, but mainly mean sea level. And that's good, something, it's one of the easiest ones to understand. It's one we've got a decent data set for, so we can see change in. So, um, how can, we, how can we measure change? What do we have around, around the state? So we've got tide gauges, and the next slide will explain what a tide gauge is. Uh, we've also got wave buoys, and I'll show a slide on those as well. Uh, we've got um, survey, so hydrographic survey is what you collect from a boat, beam down to the um, seabed floor. We've also got beach surveys, so they're sort of ad hoc, they're um, mainly in places where they've been development, but there are surveys um, that exist. Uh, we've also got photos, a knack of uh, in the process of setting up a, a beach monitoring program. And photos are great, they, they give you that short term record of change. Uh, there's also aerial, both aerial photos, uh, which are captured from the air, and they, there's record sets that date back to the 40s. From that, you can actually see how the shoreline position has changed. There's now, over the last few years, there's actually aerial. Um, survey, so it's called LIDAR, where you actually get the, the heights of the land and the heights of the seabed under the water from aeroplanes, which is pretty flash, um, and that's been collected for the southwest, not for Geraldton, unfortunately, um, but that's, these are the sort of data sets which are starting to emerge, um, and as technology improves, can actually start to get the same information from satellites. So this is a tide gauge, um, this is actually the one in Fremantle. Uh, so it's a pretty simple piece of instrument. It's just a, um, a box with a tube that goes down um, into the water. Uh, this is one of the flash new ones which fires a sort of a beam down um, to tell the, the surface of the water. The old ones used to just have a float that went up and down in the tube. That's pretty much what it does, measure the, measure the water elevation. Um, so we've got quite a lot of these. Uh, these little green, green and different colour dots are the main tide gauges around the states, uh, which the the Department of Transport uh, look after. There are a few extra in, in, in some of the extra ports which are, aren't here. But these are all, you know, this is Esperance, Albany, uh, Frio, um, well, that'll be Bunbury, Frio, up to Geraldton up here, up around the coast. So we have a pretty good data set of tide gauge records. We're lucky because Fremantle actually goes back 100 years. Um, and I'll talk, we'll see Fremantle in a second. These are wave boys. So we've also got um, wave boys offshore in about 40 metres water depth, um, but not nearly as extensive a, a network. Um, we'd love to put more in, but that's as far as, as we've got. And the longest data set here is this one um, at Rottnest, and that's only 10 years. And we'll, we'll see that a little bit. So if we take that, um, I apologise, there are a few graphs in here, but I'm just going to try and go through them slowly and there's just a few things I want you to take out from these different graphs. So if you just take the tide gauge at Fremantle, it's the longest record we have, it's 100 years, and you take the annual average water level. So the water level goes up and down, it goes up and down every day. Just take the average of that each year and you plot it out on a graph, this is what you get. Um, and the things to notice here, first of all, it's quite an exaggerated scale. So I've done, that, um, I've done that on purpose so you can see trends. Uh, the top here is uh, it's 300 millimetres, so it's, that's 30 centimetres. Um, but there is, a, there is a distinct pattern of going up. 
and I've, one of the latest slides draws the line on. Perhaps I should, uh, should also put up here, if you put on Geraldton, which is not as long a title record, it's very similar to Fremantle, very similar. If you draw a straight line through that, um, it's about 1.5 millimetres a year. Now the things just to notice here, uh, this early data set, there's lots of gaps, and it sort of looks like it's all over the place. That was collected, you know, I showed you a new tie gauge. Well, originally it would have just been a, um, a marker, probably on a timber pile, that was visually read by the harbour master. So there's not nearly the same level of accuracy. Um, if he didn't come to work, he didn't take the reading. So there are quite big gaps, there's problems with the datums. Um, generally, it's sort of after the, the 60s that people become more comfortable with the data. Um, so there is sort of some uncertainty. The other thing to notice is that it sort of goes up and down quite a bit, fluctuates around. We'll have a chat about that a little bit later. Um, and you also got to note that it is almost like dealing with statistics. So if I drew a line from here to here, I could get a much higher, higher value. So you can manipulate this depending on the, you know, your tie gauge length. If that only started recording here, we might say it was much faster. Uh, but generally, on the whole, it's agreement that it's going up. Um, and the next slide, if you did that for all the tie gauges around the world, for which there are a lot, you end up with a graph like this. So the, the reason it's a fuzzy line down here is just the error. So these are all the same, you know, it's, it's early measurements, uh, a lot of uncertainty. Let's get further up here, um, the error gets a lot smaller. And this little red line up here is, in fact, satellite measurements. So since about 1992, they started being able to measure the, the height of the ocean surface from satellites. So it suddenly becomes quite accurate. Um, and again, people have looked at this data, um, and that's the average over the whole length. And if you look at it coming across, uh, the thing to understand here is that there's, you know, there's some suggestion that there is an acceleration through here. There's quite a lot of debate whether this acceleration you see at the top is actually due to climate change um, or whether it's some, some natural fluctuations in the system. We'll talk about that a little bit. But there are some arguments that it, it is getting faster. Um, there's also some um, interesting research that's sort of just coming out new that's suggesting that some of these plateaus here are due to volcanoes. So a volcano erupts, puts a lot of ash into the atmosphere, actually slows down the warming of the, um, of the atmosphere and uh, that's one of the things that slows down sea level rise. Okay, so that was just looking at annual data, so an average over a year. There's a lot of different fluctuations which exist inside there and this is the best pictures I could get to explain this. Um, really the point I'm trying to get across is that we're currently in La Nina, which you which you may have heard. Now this rather confusing diagram is the Pacific Ocean. This is the top of Australia here, and Darwin's up here, and Tahiti is somewhere in the middle. Um, and the thing to understand is that these trade winds, the strength of these changes, and there's a difference in pressure between Tahiti and Darwin, which sort of drives that current across. What it means, without getting too complicated, is during La Nina conditions, more warm water can get pushed over the top of Australia. That warm water getting pushed over the top, uh, more of it basically drives the Lewin current. Um, and the, the Lewin current comes down this stretch of the coast. So during La Nina years, you've got more water coming over, you've got a stronger current, it can actually up the water level, and it does. Um, and it can raise the water level the, just the average water level by anything up to 0.3 of a metre. Which doesn't sound like very much, but the tidal range here is only, you know, it's only 0.8 of a metre. So if you add that little bit on, it can make quite a, quite a large difference. So that's just the, the opposite effect there. Now this, I'm going to try not to confuse you here. I did a uh, draft run to this presentation. This is where I lost the people. So. If I see black faces, you need to shout at me. This is the same data for Fremantle, which I showed you zooming up off the page. What we've done is we've taken out that, that 
continuous sea level rise trend. So I've taken out sea level rise. This is everything except for sea level rise. And what you notice is that it goes up and down quite quickly. And although there are other influences in there, the main one is the Lewin current. And you'll notice here uh, it's quite high. Now what I'm going to put on here, which is where I lost everyone, this thing here is called the Southern Oscillation Index. It's just an index in the difference between the pressure between Tahiti and Darwin. So I'm going to go up quickly. So it's the difference in pressure between here and here, which is just a way of measuring how much, simplicity, how much warm water is coming over, so how strong the Lewin current is. And you notice at the moment, although I don't have the water data in blue, I've got this, we're, it's very high. And that's, that's what we're in, we're in this La Nina. That's why um, we're getting more cyclones this year, uh, because the ocean's warmer. And you may not realize it, but that's why the water level will be a bit high. So you can get quite a mock um, change. So uh, really the point I'm trying to get across here is that you know, these changes we saw here, and um, this was in a couple of years ago, that high water level was not climate change. It was not in any way related. It was just a natural um, variations in our system. Um, and you also, you know, the sort of two main components which drive um, erosion on our coast here are water level um, and waves. So although it doesn't directly link uh, when you've got higher water level, you've got more erosion, it's just sort of part of the picture. So if you notice back here in the, you know, a lot of people remember quite a bit of erosion in the, in the 70s. We did have higher water levels during that period. And again, I'm not going to go into this, but there's a seasonal um, variation in, in the strength of this current, which also drives a seasonal variation in the water level. Those of you who are um, really on the ball would notice that over summer, the water is actually slightly lower than it is over winter, if you're a fisherman or avid beach guard. Um, this is a wave boy, just a, you know, just a picture so you can see what they're like. They get sort of lonely little thing left out in the middle of the ocean. I'm not really going to talk about waves other than to say that um, you know, this complicated graph is basically the more and higher the, spe the peaks, the stormier the year it was. It's to understand that not all the years are as stormy as other years. We get a calm winter, we get a, um, a stormy winter. The other thing is there's no obvious trend. There's no, there's no evidence of um, becoming stormier or becoming less stormy. But that may be partly because we don't have a very long data set. So it's, that's just an area that we, uh, an area that we just don't really have enough data to fully understand. Okay, so that was historic change. Um, what's going to happen in the future? So this pretty slide explains how sea rises. So the first thing that happens is that we put. Um, pollution into the atmosphere. What that does is it causes the atmosphere to warm up. And that has a few consequences. The main one is it causes the oceans to warm up. Um, and I, I didn't really understand this until a few years ago that I, I read up on it. A large component, you heat up the air, heats up the water. Water, if you remember from your early science experiments, expands as it warms up. So about 50 to 70% of sea level rise, um, as we know it, is just a thermal expansion. So it's the oceans actually expanding as they get warmer. Uh, some of the other components are um, glaciers melting. So ice on land melting, uh, running into the ocean. That's uh, you know, thought to be a relatively large, um, oh, a significant component of the change that we've seen so far. But the, you know, the, the estimates, there are any estimates, are that if you melted all the glaciers on the world, you'd increase the ocean by 40 centimetres. So in the grand scheme of things, it's, it, it's not as important as some of the other processes. Um, there's also you know, terrestrial water storage. That's only a small component. Uh, one of the things that we don't really have a particularly good handle on is land subsidence. So a lot of the coastal areas, you know, we're on sand, which is relatively young in a geological time frame. 
some areas such as Perth we're extracting groundwater. So we're expecting the ground is actually settling, but because it's only since the, you know, uh, the early 90s that we had good satellites that could really measure the height of the ground everywhere, we just don't fully have a good appreciation for that. We don't really understand. And then the big unknown um, is, the, is the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica. Um, and we know that there's a, definitely a component coming from that. Uh, the uncertainty is how much, and that's what we're going to discuss. So this is just an example of a glacier. So, you know, um, I've taken this from Alaska. I just jumped on the internet um, before this presentation. You can get these things out of Google. One of the problems with glaciers is we don't have um, fantastic records of, of how they changed. Um, one of our great records is these early photographs, uh, but there is evidence of change. Uh, what I was going to explain, because I found it quite interesting, was um, a little bit about Antarctica. So, Antarctica is on the, uh, the bottom of the globe, and Greenland's on the top. They're the two components where the ice, um, we're worried about ice melting. This section of East Antarctica um, is ice on rock above land, um, and it's thought to be you know, relatively stable. This area of West Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula, a lot of the ice is um, stuck to rock below water level. And the thing that, about being stuck below water level is as you increase the warmth of the oceans, you've got the potential to, to melt this ice, which is below water, um, it's got a greater potential to sort of, catastrophic sounds a bit dramatic, but large, large chunks to fail in a relatively quick time frame. And there's a couple of pictures of a, a few sections um, failing. The other thing that um, uh, sort of worries scientists, um, and this sort of, you hear people talk about the, this tipping point where we're all suddenly going to go towards doomsday. I think one of the main uh, reasons or explanations of what, what that means is you, you warm up the atmosphere, um, you start to melt ice. If you're starting to melt ice at a quicker rate than ice can reform, basically from snow falling, you're going to get accelerated melt. So the system is going to start to melt quicker than it can be uh, replenished, so you get this kind of uh, accelerated thing. And that's why people are nervous and um, I, you know, the, the last bit of, that I read on the plane here it was 3.1 degrees. If you get above that temperature, you're starting to melt quicker than the snow is falling. So that's the kind of theory behind this, this tipping point, as it were. So I've just got a couple of pictures. Uh, it's nice to put in pictures of these are two ice sheets, uh, which have recently sort of, I'm sure failed is the right word. So it's, you know, these are really difficult photos to, to, to see and understand. They're taken from, I think they're taken from satellites. That's why they're quite poor quality. These are kind of fractures in the, uh, in the ice. Uh, this scale down here is, I think, 10 kilometers. So this is quite a large sort of chunk of ice that broke off in a, sort of a month period. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is not to try and scare you, to tell you, you know, this is the end of the world, the whole thing's melting. It's just to explain, these are some of the things that we've seen that we know have occurred. We don't have long records in this area. One of the big uncertainties is understanding whether this is just a kind of natural trend. Is it, is it normal for these things to occur over a long period of time? Is it just a natural fluctuation? This occurred after summer temperatures were very high? Or is this a sign that things are accelerating and we're going to continue to see this kind of change in the future? And that's something that we can't really answer the question answer the question, we can ask it. Here's some pretty pictures of, of what it looks like here and things falling apart. And here's just another, another one around the corner, a similar, you know, this is 10 kilometers here, so a large, large chunk just um, broke away. So the big question you probably want to know is how much is it going to go up? That's what everyone always wants to know. So what I haven't explained to you is that there is the, what the IPCC, which stands for, many of you probably know, stands for 
the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, what that is, it's an it's a organization funded by one of the U, UN organizations. It's basically, it's meant to be independent and its purpose is to review all the scientific literature around the world and consolidate it into one nice report uh, that policy makers can use. Their last report, the fourth assessment report, came out in 2007. And the scenarios out of it, and I've simplified this back quite a lot, this is about the middle of their predictions, which are on this scale is um, 0.4 of a metre in about 100 years. And this is the top of their predictions, which is, uh, uh, depending on how you read it, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. The, um, the difficulty with these predictions is that bit for thermal expansion is relatively well understood. I've, people have told me it's not, but it's more, it's, it's better understanding. The uncertainty is, is with that extra ice melt. So it's that bit of Greenland, it's that bit of Antarctica. And the thing about the uncertainty is they describe it, it's one way. So um, we're uncertain how much higher it will be. It's definitely not going to be lower. And this, this last line here is, uh, is what the, um, the federal government used in their risk assessment climate change, which is sort of you know, 1.1, I think, in, um, in 100 years. But the way that you've got to look at it really is um, from a risk assessment point of view. We, you know, we're used to dealing with risk. Um, that's the only way, only way to really consider sea level rise. So there's a general consensus that uh, this 0.4 of a metre is, is very, it's almost certain. We can, um, we should be planning for that. This range here is, you know, quite likely, and 0.9 of a metre is what is now in the state coastal planning policy for new development. That's what has to be considered. As you get high, you know, the, the, there is some possibility. Um, as you get beyond that, we'd like to think unlikely. Um, the other thing to notice here is that you know, these are all very close um, near the start. It's only as you get towards the ends that the uncertainty is spread out. The other thing to notice is that there's only a very small rise over the next 25, 25 years. Um, and there's no kind of, there no, isn't really any argument about how much it is. Um, and over the f next 50 years, it's still quite small. You know, it's only 0.3 of a metre. So it's not insignificant. It'll have an impact, but it's not that great. It's only over the second 50 years that you really start to see this potential for a big change. So that's what I mean. It's not a necessarily a doomsday story. Um, it's that accepting that there is some inevitable change, but there is plenty of time to do adequate planning. And Enzo is going to demonstrate some, some good measures for, for mitigating our, our Australian coasts. All right, what's next? Oh, yes. So this, again, is... Um, it's quite a complicated slide, but it's quite, it's, it's quite an important one, really. Um, this is the best picture I could find. This is out of Garneau's report. And what it's trying to explain is that if we stopped polluting today, so we have a fantastic carbon trading tax introduced, uh, the global uh, community decides that's it, all renewable energy, stop pollution today, it'll take 100 years for all the carbon to be removed from the atmosphere. So there's this massive kind of lag in the system. So that's what this grey line is. It takes 100 years for it to come out. I think most of it slowly gets absorbed and eaten up by the oceans. Once you remove the carbon, um, then the temperatures will start to plateau out. Unfortunately, it'll take, you know, they, they say 1,000 years. I mean, it's probably guesswork before they start to drop off back down again. So this is one of the kind of, you know, for me, kind of depressing depressing realities is that we're pretty much already set in to, the, to this temperature rise. That temperature rise then means that you've got this thermal expansion component and it'll take a while for this to, um, to come back into balance. The ice melt will continue and this is the, this is the kind of risk, um, you know, this sort of tipping point things that, thing that people are scared about is if the temperature only comes into stabilisation too high this ice will just progressively continue to melt, basically because it's warmer um, uh, than the temperatures can sustain in those areas. So it's warmer, it's melting faster than it can fall. So I, what I really want, want you to take away is that you know, we, 
we're locked into a long-term change. Um, and those kind of mitigation measures you do now are great. So you can't eliminate climate change, but you can reduce the extent of climate change. I'm sure that's what Julia will be telling everyone when she's selling her tax. I've only got another five minutes. So what's that mean on us? We're through the hard work. Well done. And, um, you know, if you're on a sandy shoreline, increasing the water level will erode it. That's, that's not really a debate. And it's also going to cause flooding. But uh, I'll just put all these things up. Here's a picture of uh, Geraldton flooding. The thing to understand is that it's not going to suddenly, um, not going to suddenly happen tomorrow. So the changes will be gradual over time. So this is, uh, I didn't check the date on this photograph, but it must be relatively new. You know, we've got the landscaping here. It's not particularly stormy waves out here. We've got a little bit of water coming over the top. I mean, what you expect if you, if you added on 0.3 of a centimetre, of 0.3 of a metre onto the water level out here, that this would um, flood a larger area. You wouldn't need as extreme an event to get that kind of occurrence to happen. So it would just be more, the first thing will be things that you're used to, you're familiar with, places that already arrived, places already slightly inundated like that, become more frequent. And then it'll be a slightly larger extent. You know, and over time, you know, over several hundreds of years, certain places will go underwater. So this is the simple theory on um, what happens to a nice, soft, sandy coast um, when sea level rises. So sea level rises relatively quickly, um, causes erosion of the coastline here. All that sand basically gets rebalanced um, offshore underwater. And it's just a you know, simple increased water level and the system just has to come back into balance. The only way it can do that is from eroding sand off the top of the beach and depositing it somewhere at the bottom. The, the, the slightly, this is, the, this is called the Brune rule. Um, the slightly more optimistic version is that um, when the coast actually erodes, um, what happens is it erodes during a storm. So you'll, you'll get um, the storms will be able to get higher up the beach, they'll erode sand off. That sand isn't all lost offshore uh, into deep water. You know, when you have a storm, it erodes the beach, it goes off, it forms a bar, and then it actually starts to bring it back. There's a sort of a recovery phase after the storm. Um, and as water level um, goes up, it actually has the ability to, um, to continue to blow sand up the beach. Um, and here we are familiar with the formation of dunes. We understand that wind blows sand, creates dunes. So the more optimistic um, version is that these dunes will continue to grow and to migrate inland, um, but a component will still be lo lost offshore. So the reason I wanted to show this was not to get too bogged down in the science, but to, to understand that you know, if these processes are occurring, and this might be a dune migrating inland, it might be a wetland, it may be whatever kind of natural environment, if you've got a fixed building here, it's going to cause you problems. That's where your difficulty is. It's not the problem that the coast is eroding back, it's the fact that we fix something in place that it's going to hit. So where are the hot spots? This is another regular question. Well, it's a bit of a trick question because the majority of the coast really is behaving in the same manner. Um, Geraldton isn't any worse than Bustleton, it isn't any worse than Perth. It's just the fact that we, um, we built in these places. Um, and we were fortunate, or you could say unfortunate, I'm not sure, you know, we had about 2,000 years of very stable sea levels with very little change, which meant that we could come over to these beautiful islands, develop them, build our uh, fishing shacks, um, turn them into houses, and be none the wiser. So it's not really that we have these erosion hotspots. They're almost uh, planning hotspots, I would say. All right, so what do we do? Here we are. We've made it to the end. So I think you know, these are the kind of things that I wanted to sort of take away <coughs> Take away thoughts. Just, I mean, just get over the fact that climate change is going to occur. There's, there's no point in just worrying about debating that. There's a debate on how much it will occur, but whether it will occur, you know, that you should just finish that. 
Um, the same way, yeah, don't panic. Um, there are a lot of kind of crazy projections on how much it will be. I think if you, um, if you map all the ice on Greenland, uh, that's seven meters of sea level rise. If you melt all the ice on West Antarctica, that's six meters. If you melt all of Antarctica, that's 60 meters. So that's where some of those numbers come from. So if all of Greenland, all of West Antarctica, I think that's 13 meters. That's sort of quite a, quite a common number you hear. So there is the potential for that, but you know, the general consensus is that's not going to happen in 100 years or 50 years. You know, that will be several thousands of years. Uh, so we've got plenty of time to plan um, and adapt. Uh, I'd sign up for one of these carbon taxes. I, I don't support political parties, but you know, a small changes now will have an impact. We've got the ability still to change the projections. Um, and just, you know, now's the time to plan. If we plan, we adequately uh, adopt good planning, good financial management over the next 25 to 50 years, it won't be painful. If we don't and wait till we really see impacts, it will be very painful. And that's it.